Hey guys, I'm Danny Meese with Metavore, and I'm here with Annie today. Hi, I'm Annie, a bachata dancer, and just started Bachata Fusion NYC. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is my first podcast. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, so pretty, we'll keep it pretty casual, but um, we have some Prosecco we're going to review at some point. Mm -hmm. We were just drinking some iced cider from Finger Lakes Cider mm -hmm. uh, Co., I think it's Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I think it helps the algorithm if I say, you know, don't drink if you're under 21. No. Definitely not suggesting that. <clears throat> unless you're in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless it's legal where you live, I guess. <laughs> um, and then we have some Glen Farclas and Grappa as well. Um, I don't know if we'll get to that, but it's an yeah. option. I like options. Yeah. <laughs> And then we got Mr. Pumpkin here to be fully autumnal. Mm-hmm. I might put a face on it when we're done. <laughs> yeah. Give me a Sharpie. <laughs> yeah. That'd be funny if you did like a lipstick imprint on that. Oh, at some yeah. Point. That's what I should have done when I touched up my lipstick instead of like the Blind, Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so, all right. So you're a dancer. Mm -hmm. I've done social dancing before. I've done Latin dance, East Coast swing, salsa, that kind of stuff. I know what it means to me and I'll get into that at some point and what's, you know, what I find is good about it and what the benefits of getting into it are and how it even ties into metaphor. But I want to hear from you, you know, why should people social dance? Why should you show so social dance? <laughs> well, for one, you don't need language to social dance. Um, it breaks barriers. It creates connections with people that, uh, for me personally, and so many of the people that I've met through dance, including you, right? Um, it, it just creates this connection that is indescribable. Um, it releases all the good stuff in the brain, no, all the oxy, something like that, that we mentioned before in our little Yeah, the, you were saying it was like the hug drug, the, the same, hug that same drug. one, yeah, oxytocin, exactly. is that what it is? oxytocin, maybe, sure, we'll call it that, yeah. turbo scientist, yeah, exactly, <laughs> I think Mr. Pumpkin has a medical, to, medical degree, yeah, do you, so. me, do you know, <laughs> help me out, yeah. um, and it also, I feel like, there can be a different reason to dance, for each person depending on their lifestyle. So for the traveler, it can be something to do when you go to a new city, say I go to Barcelona or you know San Diego or whatever. I can kind of add this to my trip itinerary as a way to like, mm -hmm. sure you've seen the sites or you've had the business meeting, whatever your trip is about. And then at the end of the day, it gives you an opportunity to release some tension and really meet some people who live there. Mm. You know, so what one of those locations sure. could you pick one of those and say like what someone could do like what where they would find dance oh anywhere any major city any right. dance style because I have a, a swing dance background as well mm. so that was my first passion when it came to partner dancing um, and that I got into because I was living in Montana and I went to a ballroom dance event there were there was this table of people there you know ballroom dancing is a bit more formal it, yeah. this one was at the elks club in billings montana <laughs> so you know as far Slightly as the older crowd yeah thank you for putting it that way <laughs> yes exactly that and there was this table of people who wouldn't waltz with me wouldn't kind of would try to dance a bit of foxtrot because the music worked with it but they wouldn't actually foxtrot what they would only do is west coast swing and i didn't understand that like how could you be a dancer a, like a partner dancer and only know one style and then I just found the world of West Coast Swing mm. and it like totally yeah. fell in love with it. It's so a, what's the difference between that and East Coast Swing? West Coast Swing, so mm, West Coast Swing is a bit more modern essentially. Mm -hmm. East Coast Swing you do to like big bands like, da, 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 like the swing da, 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 era was essentially exactly. East Coast Swing. Exactly, yeah. like 19s, 20s kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, West Coast Swing um, it comes from the Lindy Hop, which you don't need to know anyways, but it is a slot of dance that is much more versatile to today's music. Um, for mm. example, I was on a team and we did um, some Aretha Franklin, or we did, oh God, it, I, 
basically any pop song you hear on the radio, you can West Coast swing to. You know, and, and it has so many different flavors. For me, I think this is also why I've loved so much now learning more and more dance styles. I like the opportunity to maybe be light and airy for one, you know, for three to five minutes of my life and then be mm -hmm. hip hop poppy for the next three to five gotcha. minutes of my life. And West Coast Swing allows you to transition your character or gotcha. whatever okay. part of yourself you're trying to, to It's um, more adaptable express. to various scenarios. Yeah, yeah because okay. of all the different songs that you can do it to. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've done some West Coast, but I'm not that experienced with it. Um, I find what is good about dance is it really breaks people out of their shell um, in a way that is fully in their control, right? Because they can always choose to leave or to stop exactly. dancing with people. Or just let go. Bye. Right, or just let go, yeah. <laughs> I did actually have one time where I was Latin dancing. Uh, it was bachata at a small club in uh, kind of like a speakeasy vibe in Anchorage, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And there's a super drunk chick. I couldn't tell that she was super right. wasted until we started dancing. But then she was like, oh, this is, but this is bachata. Like you're white, you know, this is, you're not going to be good at this. And I'm like, meanwhile, oh. you're in Alaska, like, right. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm not an <laughs> and, uh, so it wasn't going that great. I mean, I had been bachata dancing for a while and I was like leading her, but she was just totally wasted. They kept saying like, you don't know how to do it right. And so I literally was like, thank you for the dance. I just kind of let go. Yeah. And then she actually got really mad, but that yeah. was one of the few times that I actually was like, thank you. you know? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's like social dance etiquette that, you know, I, I think it's taught well in like the ballroom dances generally, you know, mm. like even just something like, like how to turn down a dance or exactly. Or, or yeah, there's like a formula to it yeah. for me. If I turn someone down for a dance, I need to like, not then say yes to the next person who asks me like mm. right next to them. That is so rude. Right. Or, you know, unless that person is blatantly drunk or whatever, or I can say something like, maybe I've already danced two or three songs with this person. Then that's fine. Then I can say, no, thank you. I'm going to dance around a bit. But if it's the first dance right. that they're asking me for, um, and they're not drunk, yeah. like, any other scenario, I always say yes, or if mm. I say no, then I'll just sit out the rest right. of the song because yeah, I understand. So what is the best, like, let's say a girl wanted to get into dance, uh -huh. and obviously, you know, she's a pretty girl, like a lot of guys are going to come up to her and say, like, you know, dance with me, Mama Sita. like, how do you say, what's the best way to, like, turn someone down? Yeah, it depends on your comfort level, so it, it depends on the way they approach you, so let's say they do it like that, like... Baila conmigo, mamacita, bachatera, You can say no to that if you don't if you don't want to get into that world. But right. if, you're, if you're like, okay, I'm kind of curious, then just keep in mind it's three to five minutes of your life. Mm, right. <laughs> and you're in a very public place. And you're in a you public can exit place. You want. Exactly. Yeah. You know, take your precautions if you're drinking. Put your napkin over your drink or whatever, or mm. have your safe corner where you keep your stuff. Um, oh, I just had something. I lost it though. Oh, as far as safety during the dance, during that three to five minutes, because that doesn't mean it's like a, like freedom. Like you can have me in any way you want for the next three to five minutes. Right. Yeah. Your frame as a follower, especially, and as a leader too, is how you create your boundaries. Mm. Um, and in, like pushing or pulling kind of like you choose how close it is. Yeah, yeah, and generally it's the follower who chooses the closest. I mean, as a leader, mm -hmm. too, you have the benefit of your frame, but, you know... Yeah, and a good leader it. knows, like, if you're actually dancing with someone who's good, like, I know if there's a kind of tight, wide frame coming from the follow, like, that that's her comfort level. Like, exactly. That she's like, here's how close I want to be. Yeah. And then when... Um, and then some people don't put up a frame, which is fine because they then it's just, no you, right. And then I just try to sense the person's comfort level. But if someone puts up a frame, like, you know, of, of like, okay, I'm out this far from you, then, you know, you should just know, um, as a lead to, and I, unfortunately I do think a lot of leads try to be sort of like 
have some machismo and sort of like say, I'll show you how close we're going to be and then like pull it in even if, and I think, you know, there could be a few edge cases where they end up like seducing the follow into getting super close. But am I, from what I've observed, usually it's kind of, it comes off as creepy. Like yeah. it's almost like, no, I'm going to show you how to, because why would she then dance with you again? You know? So exactly. I think it's important for follows or for leads to recognize, to really sense, you know, what their partner's comfortable with. What the follower's inviting. Yeah. 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 And I, um, for me too, like as a teacher, cause I'm also a dance teacher. I always let, especially my girls know that they can walk away at any moment. And for me, like the leaders that I get closest to are the ones that I can tell, like, are there because they're into the dance and you know, even if they are into me, that's fine. <laughs> but don't, you know, you got to have a little bit of a, of a sort of suave dude. Like, you've got to be like, oh, I just love this song. Yeah. And then show me, but through dance. Which is funny. Because for me, it's not me, your body. That let me I know have. what you think. But let's say a guy was trying to get with you. Uh-huh. Isn't it kind of more attractive if he's just like in his element and enjoying himself? Oh, yeah. Even if, like... The follower sets the frame and is like, this is how close or far away I'm comfortable with. And then if a guy is trying to be like, you know, hey, I want to dance with that cutie and get real close to her. Yeah. I want to get to know her better. Right. Kind of thing. Then, yeah, it is so much more attractive when a leader. And, and also, when I say the word leader, too, I could be talking about um, a man or a woman. I like to use the terms leader and follower when yeah. I'm talking about dance because... You know, generally the leader's the man's part, follower is the woman's part. Like there's plenty of exceptions though, so it makes there's sense. so yeah. many exceptions and even more so and I want to sort of de gender those terms. Mm -hmm. um, and some dance styles are better about that than others. Let's go right. swing, for example, is much less gendered than Latin dancing, right. of course, naturally. But yeah. However, so, if we're talking about aggressive dancers, we're probably mostly talking about it's men. men. <laughs> <laughs> right? So or very drunk women, I yeah. guess. That's yeah, true. Yeah, you know, you yeah. never know. But um, yeah, for <laughs> for somebody who wants to like maybe get a little romantic, the most attractive thing for me, and I know for a lot of the other like women that you know are my sort of comrades in this world, mm -hmm. um, is when the guy is actually like into the music, into the dance, and yeah, like like sort of connecting to you through the song and not trying to like get past that. And that almost leaves a little bit of room for you as a, as a woman or, you know, whatever to kind of like, it's like, it adds this level of mystery mm -hmm. too. when, when that person who's coming on to you, like there's a hint of that, but they're so into the music. So you kind of want to like see more. Right. Of that person. They're, they're enjoying the moment and the experience and the connection. Mm -hmm. And it goes beyond whatever their purpose was. Yeah. Because I might, I might go out dancing and it's like, I want to feel good about myself right now. And I know that when I'm done dancing, I'm like, that was great. Mm -hmm. There's other times when I go and I'm like, I want to meet people. And I even want to talk to people. And other times I go, I don't want to talk to anybody. Any of those reasons or any reason I go, like it almost melts away because it's no longer in the moment. It's more about the human connection and for me it's about just like losing myself to the rhythm and um i mean there's plenty of songs that talk about that you yeah. know, for obvious reasons like there's the was it daft punk lose yourself to dance or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's what exactly what it is and and i think the human connection part of it is where it ties into um like breaking bread coming together yeah. as a community and uh earlier we were talking about how a good dance studio or dance environment feels like a family. Yeah. And it feels like you're coming together almost like for a, you know, a celebration, like yeah. as a, and it's more about that rather than your personal reason. And what that does is it's, you know, like when you see family, it's typically less about whatever your goal was going there. It's more about just, you're going to spend time with family and have a good time and enjoy their company. And it's about that love and that community of being with yeah. people you trust. And you feel it too a lot when you feel like somebody invited you to that moment, mm -hmm. you know, and like with dances, not all styles or even dance schools have that family feel. 
Um, you know, yeah. that's what I'm going for with the Chakra Fusion NYC for sure. Like, yeah, tell us more about each that. One of, uh, I am so happy with it so far. We just started like less than a month ago and we sold out our first class. Right now we're building our ladies group. We're, we have a ladies style class, happens every two weeks. Um, so what are they learning if you have that? any friends, I only have three spots okay. left in the, the next one on Saturday. Um, sorry, what was your question? Oh, what are they learning in this talent class? What they are learning mean? ladies, uh, essentially followers of a Chapa style. Okay. And we're called the Chapa Fusion because that allows, I have this incredible choreographer who um, has an amazing like international sort of curriculum as a dancer. She won the 2018 Salsa Champion in uh, in Beijing. It was amazing. a world championship though. Yeah, she's amazing. And we called it Pacheta Fusion. What's her name again? Her name's Kate. <laughs> and her last name is, she's from Kazakhstan, so it's like Vershki or something, but oh, okay. I'm not going right. to, you know. I, I Does would she have, have the Kazakhstani accent too? A little bit okay. too. It's adorable. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so you got you got a couple of legends. At the, at the yes, US yeah, studio. right away. And so our yeah. our group classes right now are at an inter, at intermediate level, um, but we do offer privates for whatever level our our mm, person Interesting. Is. Okay. So we're so you're really targeting the existing dancing community. That's how we're primarily. starting because of the level that our choreographer is at. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as me and the privates that I teach. My target actually is people who's never heard of, who have never heard of bachata. Mm. Those are my favorite students because then I get to show them like right away. Like I don't have to break any bad habits or anything, which I'm happy to do. Like I'll bring. Isn't that strange? <laughs> like I love again. Like if I go to a social dance, like you know bachata, especially, mm -hmm. I want to dance with the newbies. Yeah, like, there's something just so fun about someone who's like, I don't really know what I'm doing, but yeah. it's just like. Well, you're basically moving to the music, and there's here's the general gist of it, yeah. and just getting them into it that way, yeah. and without the assumptions and the oh, this is how I learned it in this state or whatever. Yeah, and it's because you know if, if you're really synced up with a partner, it's less about. Um, and let me know if you disagree, but it's less about like are you doing the specific steps, and it's more about are you flowing well with them in the song. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I often will actually seek out the new dancers. Yeah. Yeah, it's more about the connection, which again is is what this your podcast is about. No connection, yeah. breaking bread, and everything. So the newbies are great for that because you also get to see like they don't have that pretense going into the dance, and and whatever they follow, you're like, cool, that you can do it that way too, you know. So yeah, and I also sometimes I'll even mix East Coast swing into bachata or into other dances, which some people get kind of pissed off about that. But then it's fusion. But it's fusion. fusion and Love it. Yeah. Because for me, it's more about the dance. And there's parts of bachata that I don't like. There's certain moves I've learned in bachata mm -hmm. where I'm like, I don't, might not even use that one again. Yeah. Nah, I can take it or leave it. Yeah. But then the ones that I do love, I'm like, yeah, I love those moves. Mm -hmm. And same in East Coast Swing. People will do like, um, what's the, what's it called? The Last Charleston. Oh, yeah, I think. yeah. Oh, I love that. Right. Well, I actually, and it, when I've done it, I'm not a big fan for me, uh, but I could be persuaded to like it. I'm sure. <laughs> but that's one of the ones where every time we were doing it in, in East coast swing dance studios, I go, uh, you know, I'm going to sit this one out. I don't know why it was just like in my heart. I didn't, it didn't, yeah. it didn't immediately connect to me. Whereas East coast swing, like the standard one, whatever it's called mm -hmm. and bachata, like those two just clicked with me and just, I don't even have to think about it. I just love dancing. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if it is a simplicity because I think because for me it's more about the connection and less about the performance of it or mm -hmm. the show. It's more about like just human connection and enjoying the music. Maybe that's why I'm drawn mm -hmm. toward the more simple ones. Yeah. Uh, but the most amazing dance experience I had, the most memorable one at least, was probably not Latin dance, not East Coast Swing. It was when... I went to this um, actual this uh, soccer tournament multi multicultural event thing in Ohio, which was like a soccer tournament during the day, and then there were like Romanians and Greeks and Arabs and stuff. They're actually all Orthodox Christian. Sounds like party people to me. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and it was like a festival where they eat all the cultures brought their different foods, and then there were all these. They taught us 
all their different cultural dances. And I had done some of the Greek ones and some of the Arabic ones, but here there were just an infinite number of dances mm -hmm. to learn. And everyone was coming to it brand new, or most people were, because they were from this culture and the other person was from that culture. Mm -hmm. And it was just great. There was food, people enjoying each other's company, and we were all tired from the soccer games earlier, but still danced all well, night. Well, all the cultures you mentioned, too. Like, to me, like, a night out with a group of Greeks is, like, loud and Wild. boisterous, and they will definitely bring that to the dance. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think one of the accurate things about the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding is, like, even the Greeks that, that seem like, they're like, oh, I go to church every Sunday, like, I'm very, you might think that they're mm -hmm. kind of, like, I don't know, proper or something, or, but really, they're Parties. Like oh, just, yeah. They, they want have, to have a good reason time. to go to church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they got they got to confess for what happened Friday or Saturday night. Yeah. No, it's true. Which yeah. reminds me. <laughs> right. It's funny. I mean, I'm sure some Orthodox Christians will watch this because my family is actually Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they probably will. But um, for me, there's what I noticed is there's definitely a big difference between like white American Orthodox Christian, which for me was Antiochian mm -hmm. growing up. It was okay. Antiochian Orthodox. And then we knew Greek Orthodox, which typically they're making, they're visiting Greece all the time. They're actually, a lot of them are born in Greece and they're partiers, you know? So we, when we met them, it's like, yeah, they, they, they're practicing, you know, Orthodox Christianity and all like, and going to services and everything. But then like, they're like, their culture is way more, way less like, you know, I'm going to be prim and proper and more. Yeah, they are the partiers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and they'll bring it to the dance floor for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, so my big fat Greek wedding with that is, is pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, and I actually had a trip to Greece planned, but because of the whole pandemic yeah. thing, I, it just got canceled. Yeah, but that makes, but... Yeah, that makes me think of like some of the... Oopsie, sorry. I'm That's just fine. Just looking at your yeah, blanket. Just... Um, some of the like super beginner dancers who come from these cultures, well, they just like let go and party. So maybe we'll meet for a salsa dance, but they don't even know the do, 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 mm -hmm. you know, one, two, three, five, six, seven. That can still be one of the best dances of my life because their attitude is just like, forget it. Let's just have fun. And that's really what it's about anyways. Yeah. yeah. What's a cool experience that you had? Like the coolest or wildest or just most memorable dance event or random happenstance? Mm, okay, I'll talk about my first. I've had so many. So, so let me just talk about the first dance event that I went to that was for West Coast Swing. I was living in Montana, and this group of us were going to go down to Denver, which is an mm -hmm. eight-hour drive from my city, mm -hmm. uh, and go to this event called 5280, and like I'd never been, I heard it was really cool, whatever. Basically, a dance event is like 72 hours straight of dancing. There's classes all day and social dances all night. And there was no other outlet where you could just dance like that. Like, like there's this thing called the breakfast club at these kinds of events. The people who dance until 7 or 8 o'clock <laughs> in the morning take a picture of our like totally torn apart selves and then go to breakfast together, then go take a two hour nap, wake up mm. and then start doing workshops the next day. So just like That's my awesome. first time, yeah, my first time at this like world, this side of dance was one of the absolute best because you've got like the midnight food truck, you know, that comes in like the coordinators mm. of these events think of and what kind of food? the details like breakfast, like breakfast, breakfast. burritos, yeah. but different places. Like there's an event close to the Liberty Swing, which is in um, June. It's the New York City one, but it's actually in New Jersey. Um, they have food trucks, but they have like a faux truck, like that, um, you know, that soup, faux soup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or they'll yeah, have like a taco truck or whatever. So different coordinators yeah. will... Like, think about, okay, okay, what kind of fuel do these dancers need at, you know, between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., depending on, like, what they're, what they, mm. time they want to eat, you know? Yeah, one of my, uh, I, that triggered a memory of mine where I had been, I think it was after that quinceanera mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier, um, you know, this Latino family's house, 
I know, knew this one girl from Latin dance and knew uh, her family as an extension of that. And then she had a 16 year old relative that threw that party and it's like, you know, just a whole family affair. And then the next day, um, I just remember going to McDonald's with one of the guy, one of my friends. Um, and we were both like, we had hangovers and we're just eating like yeah. you know, McDonald's in the morning. The camaraderie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. It's, it's, it's a classic dance uh, memory too. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Now it's, it's funny though that, I don't know where I was going with that. I don't know why it's funny. Mm-hmm. Dancing. Yeah. One thing about like going to something like a quinceanera or anything, um, I, been really close to Guatemalan people and now Dominican people, like through Guatemalan for other reasons and Dominicans now for dance. And uh, there's always food. You never leave hungry. <laughs> it's the best. Mm, yeah, you know? that one like at the, house I was an talking event about. Or a party or whatever. Yeah, and they just try to like, 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 as soon as you get there, it's like, let's eat right away, da da da, and cake and always too things. much. Yeah. Always, which is a great problem. <laughs> right, it's like, what, what should you maybe not do before yeah. dancing for hours and gorge yourself with delicious food? Yeah, right? and I think about these, like, these family gatherings that include dance versus ones that don't. Like, you know, anybody, my boyfriend actually is Dominican-American. His parents are from the Dominican Republic. And anytime we go hang out with this family in the park, they're always playing music and we're dancing and it's so much fun. And I think about that compared to like my family reunions, which is just like, yeah. you know, sitting around, sitting around yeah, my family too, yeah. and like asking about the potato salad. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because this is a frustration I have with, I guess, like maybe Western society, mm-hmm. maybe specifically white Western society. It's like they don't have, like white people don't have a dance. They used to a swing, yeah. but now it's like there's just pretty much club they dancing. Kind of and then yeah. what, is there a dance that like families dance with their kids and then couples dance and then older people dance? No, like there's... What happened? I mean, that's kind of what I, what I thought West Coast Swing was. Like when I discovered it, it I think I was like, 20 or 21 when I discovered it I was like oh this is what us white people do <laughs> <laughs> right and I guess I'm wrong in every single way because there's definitely some much better than me not white kids there's that's no, not for what I'm sure. trying to say but I was like oh maybe yeah. this is like that part of no the, no. you've and never you heard of like, like, Flynn. <laughs> yeah, and you can say that maybe ballroom, like waltz and stuff, there are occasions where and, people will do it, yeah, but it's always very rare. It's, it's like super rare, formal events. And that was also associated with the uh, the aristocracy. Right. You know, so it was... It was never the people's dance to the It was a certain together. percentage of yeah. people that it could have been allowed to, because if you think about the... Um, and that what would have been you a ball, required right? to do, say, a, a good waltz, you need a big wooden floor. Mm, well, yeah. what families had access yeah, yeah. to a big open wooden floor? You know, yeah. certainly not mine. <laughs> right. And that would explain why it's so rare, because it's it, it never was actually like passed down through generations to most people. It was yeah, just not to the general public. And to be honest, like the people that I danced. Uh, a ballroom with in Tennessee were just like the really wealthy people that live down the street. Exactly. Like it was not something that it's for many people. Did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's kind of like golfing a little bit. It like falls into that category yeah. of accessibility. Right. So I, I like that you're taking the fusion approach because I think that might be the way for, you know, I guess, I guess it's Western culture, or maybe it's just the world, I don't know, to reclaim like a social dance. Like, how do we get people to start dancing together and to realize the benefits of it? Yeah. Because what, I mean, there's so many benefits, right? They've shown that it helps you retain like brain cells, I think. Oh yeah, you're much less likely to get Alzheimer's. Yeah, and it, and I found it makes me sharper. It's a form of cardio, obviously. It's a form of resistance training, especially if you're a lead. Mm-hmm. Um, and, oh man, I mean, yeah, I've gotten more of a, I've gotten sore from dances in ways that like working out with weights in the gym 
would never get any sore. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, especially East Coast Swing, actually. I used to practically injure myself in East Coast Swing because I would do all these crazy dips and stuff. Oh, yeah. And, and now that I weight train, it's actually very rare that I injure myself dancing. So that's like, I think that's smart for leads to do mm -hmm. or for, I guess anyone to do really. But if you're holding up someone's body weight at weird angles, sometimes you should probably keep yourself like relatively strong so that you're not injuring yeah. like some, your hip or something. Yeah. And it's <laughs> also about, um, understanding like there's different concepts of contrabalance. So mm -hmm. if you, or, or understanding like where, for example, if you're doing a dip as a leader, um, it is not safe to dip your follower with your hands like way out here. Right. It's much safer and more secure if you're dipping, but your followers right here mm -hmm. because then they're close to your center of gravity. Right. So you have to, Yeah. of course you should, you know, for your own sake, train and, you know, what you're saying is if you have good method, do, you're but there's a lot safe. of methods. There's some tricks. Yeah, okay. So yeah. anybody can do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was probably bad dancing on my part. Like, cause I used to do dips with people that they didn't necessarily know how to do the dip. And mm -hmm. I was just really enthusiastic and would go for it. Yeah. And I was strong enough to catch them, but in the process, sometimes injuring myself. Um, so not the wisest thing, yeah. but that, that's something I've always prided myself in is like having never dropped a dance partner. I'm sure that'll happen eventually and I won't yeah. be able to say that anymore, but anytime I was within a girl around in like East Coast swing or some dance, I would, uh, and she's like, ah, I'd reassure her, don't worry, I never dropped anybody. That's great. So I can still say that to this day. We'll see if that <laughs> keep continues. Keep it up. Yeah. Keep it up. I believe yeah. in you. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to keep it up. Um, but no, I'm, yeah. I mean, I think if you keep. The person close to your center of gravity, you're pretty safe. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, you pick up a box. You're supposed to pick up a box. With your legs. Like, well, yeah. And if, and sometimes you have to use your back too, but it should be close to you. It should be mm -hmm. touching the tips of your feet. Same yeah. thing applies to dancing. It sh they should be as close to your center of gravity. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Maybe we should uh, try, actually, how much is left on your timer? Why you gotta be so mysterious right now? Oh, okay. It's here. A minute forty-four. Okay. Sounds like enough time to just be warm. Let's let's pop the prosecco. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's fine. I don't care if it gets in the <laughs> Okay. So this is what is this? Um, asinum or asinum? That is, no, it's probably asinum. <laughs> asinum. Uh, prosecco from the liquor store near my work. Yeah. I, I love it. So what inspired you to choose a Prosecco versus anything that like, what about Prosecco? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he made the shot. <laughs> well, it's, it's what was at the store uh -huh. that I've had before and uh -huh. I knew was solid. So that's why I got Prosecco. Awesome. Yeah. Could I do the honors of opening it actually? I love oh, opening sure. these. What's from here? You're not going to shoot it, are you? No. Okay. No. I just like. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> there we go. I used to open several of these a day from the restaurant I used to work at. Ah, oh, nice. Now I only open a bottle of bubbly when I have a visitor, <laughs> which is not very often with the times today. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I like Prosecco. It's, it, it's actually more consistent than Brut or Champagne, I've found. Yeah, this is true. It's like they have more, I think they have more rules about how it has to be or taste or something. So it, it's, yeah, the consistency is there for sure. Like you can get, if you're getting cheap bubbly, get Prosecco. Yeah. It's generally more likely to be refreshing and... Yeah. I'll actually do that. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> mm. Mm. It's good. Yes, thank you. Are you picking up any notes? Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> that's right, that's what this is about. Uh, a little green apple. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, it has like the acidity of a, like the citrus a little kind of tang. To it. Yeah. Um, on the nose, I smell like a little bit of lemon, but not like a Myers lemon, but like a 
More of a Latin lemon. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But... I don't know how to explain it. More of like a, like a Myers lemon is a bit more round of a smell. It's like the kind of lemon. Okay. Like it's not just sharp, citrusy. It's, it's more like in a soap. Okay. Yeah, versus like the kind mm-hmm. of lemon that you use to cut through like a steak marinade. That one's a oh, bit more okay. acidic. So it's a lot of acidity and citrus. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a very. I like it has a sharpness to it. A little bit of pear on the note, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, like um, the green ton of pear, you know, like the. Yeah. Um, maybe a bit of like blossom. Yeah, that all sounds right to me. <laughs> um, it has a nice sharpness to it, mm-hmm. and a very, very subtle nuttiness. Like, mm. very subtle. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's like... Yeah. Yeah, almost like a little marzipan aftertaste. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, overall it's kind of like sharp and punchy, and mm-hmm. but still very smooth and just straightforward. Mm-hmm. This isn't like one of those super complex or super interesting ones. It's just very solid, mm-hmm. very delicious, but then has a nice slight kind of tang to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm into it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of my go-tos. Mm. But, um, oh. so what's your drink of choice? My drink of choice. Uh, I love bubbles because I always feel, you know, champagne. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, whatever's on the menu. <laughs> Wherever I am. Yeah. Um, uh, do you get bottles a lot? Or do you do by a glass? It depends. It depends on the situation because um, I, you know, when I go out, like the only, a little bit, a little bit, a lot. (laughs) That's what I was thinking. It's like when you tell someone, yeah, get what you, whatever you want, but order as if you're paying, you know, like. (laughs) Yeah. Do you have any favorite brands of champagne? Um, no. No. I guess we're talking about brute, right? Because most, technically. Cause I like dry. I, I don't. I don't usually go for the sweet kind of stuff. Mm. Um, or you know, I also really like a good organ Pinot, like Pinot Noir. Okay. Like I really. You said organ. Yeah. Oh. Organ has some nice Pinot. Okay. Um, generally, when I drink wine, I don't like American wine. Um, I prefer. Yeah. Yeah, like French, yeah. I like that old world kind of taste, or a lot of Spanish wines are good, like a good Rioja is nice. Okay. Um, are you, do you like red wine? Yeah, 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 usually, but but lately, I don't know, my taste buds have changed with the quarantine. I went on this, yeah. I did this detox, and I've never been the same since, you know, now all of a sudden, like I, I don't think a detox like, is supposed to be with wine, though, you're I, supposed to do like... I did it with all the things, <laughs> and I swear, I came out of it like with a fresh palate, I don't know what happened to me, but now What I, was the detox? Like, um, what is, do you stay away from certain things? I, I, um, I only ate fruit and, fruits and vegetables for 10 days, and I did no caffeine, oh. no alcohol, like, I was just like, you know what, I'm not going out because... The it's Mormon like, diet. Maybe, or yeah. Or is it Scientologist? I don't know. One of, I don't know. One of those doesn't drink caffeine or, or Oh, Mormons drink don't do, yeah, that's yeah. Mormons. Okay. <laughs> but it was like then on top of that, like a vegan version. And basically oh, right. the, the reason that I did that too is because before everything happened with, um, you know, having to stay home, yeah. I found that my lifestyle dictated what I was eating and like putting into my body. Mm. You know, because yeah. I am such a social person, you know, and, and I was not raised to say no to anything. Like, yeah. like if somebody offers you this, you eat it and you clean the plate, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and in yeah. moving to New York, I just had experience going out with all these different people. New York is very much like a go out kind of place, not a stay in with your friends kind of place, I feel. Just by the sort of infrastructure of it you know you don't really have room here for like you know five friends as you would like if you go to a restaurant i guess it depends on how close you are <laughs> yeah when i was in a studio it was definitely interesting to right, if you have like four people over, yeah now we're, <laughs> half of us are going to sit on the edge of my bed and half of us are going to stand off yeah awkwardly. if you're close enough to invite them to sit on your bed or not and then it's like why don't we just meet out somewhere 
No, I'm yeah. Close, but not that close. That's got to be the root of part of the reason why New Yorkers don't cook. So many yeah. New Yorkers pretty much don't cook. I mean, yeah. on average. And part of it's because the social, like, the social logistics of it are so complicated. Yeah, it's true. Well, and half of them don't have real kitchens. That in the time, like, in New York, you don't have time to cook. <laughs> you know, if you have a day job, you leave at, like, I don't know, 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever, and you don't get home till say, 7 or 8 at night. And... Mm. Who wants to come home and cook after that or like it's, go by the store? Even people that live close to their job, a lot of times their commute is going to be pretty long because walking plus subway yeah. is long. And then if you're driving, the traffic makes it long. So it might seem like it's way less commuting than, say, LA. And it is in most cases. Mm-hmm. But it's still like a lot of commuting. And then, I mean, because it's such a hustle culture in New York. People are almost always staying late. And yeah. if they have like an office job, for example, yeah. they're almost always working longer than eight hours. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, and I found in the quarantine, I cook way more now. Oh, I love it now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And it's healthy. I feel healthier. Um, I feel more myself when I'm cooking at home mm-hmm. a lot. I think if I get in that cycle of eating out a lot, I just <laughs> feel like, lo- like uh, almost like a desperation for like, okay. What's my next gonna be, meal gonna be? Instead of like knowing, oh, I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna have like roast chicken and veggies and yeah. potatoes and wholesome. It's hard to get that at a restaurant unless you're doing fine dining too. Exactly. The wholesome home cooked meals are pretty much only present yeah. if you go and spend like twenty, thirty dollars a plate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is just not sustainable. And there's something therapeutic about cooking as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you're kind of like taking care of yourself, and if you get some nice music, say it's jazz or maybe a podcast or whatever, yeah. like you can just kind of get in the zone and, and like right. put your phone away, you know, that kind of thing. Or watch like Law and Order SVU on Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. been doing a lot of that lately. Wow, you must be able to multitask really well if you can watch it while you're cooking. <laughs> well, yeah, usually it's playing in the background. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's something I came into yeah. a lot as SVU. And yeah. so we've been watching all that. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I could talk forever about cooking. Um, I think, so back to dancing. Mm-hmm. I'm curious if you were going to convince, if you're going to have to convince somebody that they should start social dancing, whether it be Latin dance, mm-hmm. you know, bachata, East Coast swing, West Coast swing, any of these, mm-hmm. what would be your. How would you convince them? Like, what, um, what would be the, the things that would convince them to start, do you think? Whew. Did you hand me the, the Prosecco? Yeah, absolutely. For me, I think it's been a lesson for me, actually, to, to understand that not everybody's as um, enthused by dancing as me, <laughs> but if they have even the slightest curiosity, it's my reason is why not. Mm. You know, like right, you can leave exactly you after can five minutes. You can leave, yeah. and you are sort of opening yourself up to a world of so much opportunity. I think too that there's so many different styles of dance that there is something out there for everyone. So. If you're more of like a smooth and mysterious kind of person, maybe the foxtrot is your thing. Or if you want something that's a bit more lively and like high energy, then there's salsa. Like, and there's so many different sides of yourself that you might not know existed. Like for me, um, bachata, like sensual bachata, five years ago, I never would have thought would have been my thing. Mm. And I actually, um, I was in a... Was it just like dancing that close with strangers was like... Dancing that close was very scary for me. And then I I actually was in a relationship with someone for years who then I had to stop all dancing completely. So I put all dancing to a stop for a couple of years and... um, That was like a requirement of that person? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just... 
the things you do for love. <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. common story, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, but then coming out of it fueled me even more so to, to try these sensual styles. And I, you know, bachata sensual, it's like I can't say it in English or Spanish. I'm like, bachata sensual or sensual bachata if I'm speaking English. Lo siento, mi gente. Right. <laughs> but, um, but then if you say sensual bachata, it almost sounds like you're saying sexual bachata. Yes. So people are thinking that it's just like, it's like pornographic or something, but really it's like a style of bachata. No, and and there, so it's, there are yeah. clear distinctions. Like when I'm teaching lady style for sensual bachata, I let my girls know, like, you know, if you do some styling with a hand, you run your hand maybe along the rib cage or whatever, but you don't go like here. That's like, that's not sensual anymore, that's you know? Exactly. <laughs> like, you can do it. There are really places can, where that. Depending will, on your, your yeah. partner or whatever. But just at least know what the guidelines are. If you want to break them, at least you know you're breaking them. Right. <laughs> um, and so for me, like, it's kind of fueled this this um, self-exploration in me because you're so there are some styles that um, provide more space between the leader and follower so if you're new that might be a better way to get started and then um, eh. like bachata is a perfect example because open position is super far compared to bachata central yeah, yeah central, central bachata see I got I, it uh, too. yeah <laughs> Um, it's the same. One other really good style, if you want to be more sensual and have a connection that's almost at the level of your breathing, is Zouk, Brazilian Zouk. Have you tried that? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the same lady that got me into West Coast Swing was oh. really into Zouk. She had like a Zouk West Coast dance studio. Yeah. Coast, yeah. Oh, wow. She was Italian. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But she's really flaky. So really? she started all these classes and she was an amazing teacher, but then she just would like not show up to her lessons. And it was like, man, wow. so it was weird. She's like, you know, an artist as far as being like mm -hmm. an amazing dance teacher, just very, just like inspiring and would get you to dance to the music and not worry too much about being legalistic. But then unfortunately she just didn't have the consistency to like yeah. keep up her, her dance lesson schedule. Yeah. But that's where, that's where I learned to. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, but that's another style. Like, if you just want to, like, for me, Zook is the closest thing to a hug of all the styles. And you have to mm -hmm. let go of everything that you think you're supposed to do when you Zook, and you just have to, because, like, I, when I first started as a Zook dancer, I was coming from uh, the West Coast Swing World, which has like a lot more tension and mm. um, there's extension and compression in the West Coast Spain connection for dance versus like, for example, bachata, you always keep that sort of light, just a little bit of tension here, but you're not pulling and you're not pushing as you do in West it's Coast Spain. more of a linking, yeah. Yeah, and, and, but in bachata, it's a bit more sharp, the styling and everything, but if you try to go sharp with the zook, then you're almost kind of like, it's it's almost like, it's like if someone is telling you a, a story and you um, kind of like shout out the next line, like, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, it just doesn't go with the flow of that style. You're just kind of supposed to go with it and... Mm. and Ah, it's so difficult to yeah. explain. So this is why you have to dance. And the interesting thing is with all these styles, the interesting thing is that the cultures around them, like the types of people that are attracted to them, mm -hmm. sometimes are different too. So mm -hmm. if you went to East Coast Swing and you found that that wasn't your crowd, mm -hmm. um, like I found East Coast Swing dancers tend to be more, like slightly more, I guess like a little bit more uptight, a little bit more like buttoned up, a little bit more yeah, like, like a, formal my, almost. My, wouldn't mind to wear a suit. Right. Yeah. And you might find a guy that wears like a suit and a fedora at swing dance. Like that's an example mm -hmm. of that kind of crowd. And then if you go and dance bachata, mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to find a lot of people who are just like really chill, just moving to the music. And it's yeah. very like very chill, very relaxed. And yeah. it's a different vibe. And so you can, and then if you don't like that, you can go try, you know, ballroom dancing, or mm -hmm. you can try going and doing the more jazzy stuff. Did you say Zouk was for 
jazzy type of music? Yeah, or, or Zouk, like, I feel like there's a lot of Zouk ladies who are also really into yoga, you know, to kind of mm, get an idea, like, into that, that sense, yeah. mind, body, breath connection kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, because in I, the teacher that I worked with for Zouk, I found her, her West Coast and Zouk were similar because it was all about, like, it was all about, like, the movement of the body being, like, almost prolonged and... Mm-hmm angular and with the music but in a slow way and it was less about you know so in those way i guess that way those dances had some similarities so so much so that i forgot the difference between yeah. i can't even think back what the difference between the two was yeah. at the time i think but. yeah some of the similarities in west coast swing and zook as well is that like the zook basic step is uh how do I explain it? When I take a zoo class, like the follower one usually starts with the right foot and, but as does with West Coast Swing, but the one in the music, like when you start your basic, uh, can change. It can happen on the three or the six, like in, if you're kind of, these are some technicalities, but West Coast Swing is similar in that the West Coast Swing basic step is a six count step. Mm. Which means, you know, as a dancer, because we dance in eight, five, six, seven, eight, what? Um, then if you have a six count basic, then sometimes your basic will start on the seven instead of the one, or whatever. It's, it's gotcha. So that said, versus bachata, which is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You mm. know, so it always falls like it fits perfectly in the eight counts. Mm hmm. You know, so um, West Coast Swing and Zook then, like, somehow it just takes a certain open-mindedness, <laughs> which then creates an, an open... Because oh, they're more like, flexible open, or something? Like, it's more... Like, you fluid. have to be more flexible with the timing. Okay. And then also the moves then are even more, there's more room to stretch the moves out. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. that sounds like what I'm And used so to more, more room for self-expression in them. Mm, yeah, it kind of reminded me of, do, of watching like a modern dance uh, to a slow song or something. Yeah. Because I went to a, a graduation performance of a ballet dancer mm-hmm. back in Tennessee, mm-hmm. and they were doing like modern dance to some slow song and it was just super interpretive and super long and up but but slow and then and zook and west coast swing kind of reminded me of that almost like that smooth like rolling out and and stretching out and doing mm-hmm. your own flourish mm-hmm. so it's all it seems to have something in common with a lot of the performance dances like it's it's like because i feel like a lot of the more dis popular social dances tend to be the more either spinny ones or just momentum-based ones, right? Like, I feel like East Coast mm-hmm. Swing, very momentum-based. Yeah. Bachata, it's like bouncing back and forth and sometimes spinning slowly, and it's like momentum-based. But then I think some of them fall more into that almost flourishy, I don't know what to call it, but it's like expressive almost. It's more, it's, well, uh, one sort of point to that is like with West Coast Swing, the follower has much more room to be creative and expressive. Um, the follower oh. in West Coast Swing, so yeah. West Coast Swing ends with the anchor step, uh, which is like, uh, doesn't matter what the anchor step is basically, but it's a count and a half where the follower's only job really is to create extension once again, or to kind of like pull out a little bit and mm-hmm. create the space. So what he or she, the follower, is doing in that time, the follower can do like a whatever they want with their body and their legs. That's what I remember with it is that it was very, you're talking about West Coast? Uh Yeah. It was very, you just kind of can do what you want in a lot of parts of it. So you can be expressive. um, And as someone who doesn't like, dancing on my own as much like mm-hmm. without a partner for some reason for me i love partner dance but i'm not the kind of guy that typically unless i'm have had a lot to drink we'll just go on the dance floor and go crazy you know i can do that and i might do it if i'm trying to just be funny 
but it's not where I lose myself to music. Yeah. That's not what I'm. And so for that kind of dance, if, if someone is the type of person that loves to move to music on their own and be super expressive without needing to like follow the follower or the leader and they want to be really expressive, then I think West Coast yeah. is probably a really good one for West them. Coast it allows a lot of room right, yeah. for self-expression. Yeah. 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 But I find too, like I'm kind of the same way. Like I have all this experience as a dancer, but I still have so much better of a time when I have a partner to dance with. Want some more Prosecco? <laughs> sure. Fuck me up, fam. Right? <laughs> I'm still not sure if I'm going to bleep cuss words. Because I... Oh. Because oh. <laughs> um, I know some YouTubers and stuff, they bleep all that stuff. Because it helps with the algorithm. But I don't know. Oh. We're drinking booze, so it's not really kid-friendly content, is it? Right? No. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't want, I'm not sure how family friendly could, because I've also thought, I think I'm going to do like a burlesque episode or something. Like oh, that. that'd be cool. Yeah, and so I'm thinking like maybe this isn't that family friendly. Maybe some of your episodes, just depending on the content, you can decide what you do. Yeah. Or do they all have to be? I do want to think about my audience and figure out like, I mean, when this grow as this grows, I'll learn yeah. more what people are interested in, um, but um, yeah. Actually, I'm curious, um, to those of you listening or watching, if there's any type of guest you want, like a certain type of guest or a certain topic that you want covered, um, if you're listening to podcasts, podcast, just uh, comment on an Instagram post um, or go to the YouTube post and comment. If you're on YouTube, just, you know, drop it down in the comments mm -hmm. and just let me know, you know, what kind of guest do you actually want to see? Some people, someone said sommelier, and that's why I'm probably going to yeah. interview sommelier at some point. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's pretty fluid, so. Yeah, I hope my friend can come through. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, this is a good Prosecco. Mm-hmm. What's your guilty pleasure food? For food? I've been really into... Okay, so I mentioned the cleanse that I went on for a little bit, and since then I haven't been doing dairy, except I've just had a little bit of your cheese, because like, oh, it's been a while since I've had wine and cheese. Mm. Um, so I've been exploring dessert, like non-dairy dessert options, and I love Ben & Jerry's non-dairy half-baked. It's like brownie okay. and peanut mm. butter, and uh -oh. like the combo of that with Netflix. Has been <laughs> like, yeah, that's been my nights off of dancing for sure, or even at the end of the night from dancing. Oh man, sweets and binging a show or something yeah. is the best. Yeah, uh, binging both sweets and the show. No. <laughs> yeah, like, I've gotten, I used to be, oh man, I used to be such an ice cream guy, like, mm -hmm. I, but it was a problem because mm -hmm. I would, I mean, that was the sugary thing that would get me. Yeah. Um, I would just eat like a whole pint of it or whatever. Yeah. Um, now I still love it, but I think I just got tired of it. So it's just more It's something rare. you have to train yourself not to have. Like when you're used <laughs> to not having it for a while, then you're kind of yeah. like, oh, I'm good. It's fine. But when you get used to it. Yeah. Growing up, it was like always in the freezer. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as it ran out, we'd try to get some more. And I just grew up having ice cream around. And I think I, I was yeah. trained to just... That was me, actually. I was like, yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I totally thought it was someone like to squealing you. upstairs or something. No, that was my squeal. Yay. That was me like holding back the yes. Like Larry David? Larry's <laughs> like, eh, eh. <laughs> Nice, okay. Something like that. <laughs> I think it was that. Oh, that. Oh. All right. The ghost. Sounds like singing bowls up there. Like you got some yogis for neighbors. Yeah, I got some weird neighbors. Oh, we should just... mm. One day, right on the on the um, balcony, we heard this this guy just shouting like all this stuff. I think it was an assignment for class or something. He was just shouting like, "I hate my landlord." And bro, just getting everything oh. off his chest, and he was like shouting out That's into cool. the, the sky. Yeah. Oh man, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> my roommate and I have a very, um, like, sort of hot and cold relationship. So I feel like if I did that practice at home, 
He would just think that I'm like yelling all the things that I don't like about him. Because that's <laughs> the only source of tension in my life right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, living alone is definitely different than living with people. And yeah. it has pros and cons for sure. Um, oh, I'd be yeah. happy to be alone. <laughs> but actually, he's been a much more tolerable roommate lately because I think he's been getting laid. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. Yeah, no, but definitely. like, like I swear, the past two weeks, chesty. he's just been like, like nothing really. Like he used to nag a lot, you know. Like I'm a decent mm-hmm. roommate. I don't leave dirty dishes and stuff. But oh, what like I do is I put my dishes like in the drying rack and I just let them dry and then I'll leave go the house go do my thing. So he'll be annoyed that the dishes aren't put away. Oh, classic. And then yeah. yes, and and yeah. I just like the last time he tried to bring it up, I was like, all you do is nag, Tom. Like, don't talk to <laughs> me anymore. If you're just gonna nag, blah blah blah. Lately, he's talked to me and it's not been naggy, and I'm like. I know what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think he had a very lonely quarantine. <laughs> and yeah, I'll know that, like, if I'm, like, extra emotional at work, I'm like, has it been a while? Yeah, okay. It's yeah. been a little while. And <laughs> that's, that, that definitely, I'll get more, like, sensitive and mm-hmm. uh, and easily upset, mm-hmm. you know, if it's been a while. Which is why you should dance. Honestly, I don't need to get laid if I've been dancing, because sometimes it's mm-hmm. better than sex. <laughs> well, I mean, it's got to be similar drugs, right, Like that are being released in your Absolutely. body. Absolutely. Because it's human connection, it's really enjoyable and stress-relieving to, like, dance, mm-hmm. and the music really relaxes you, and then I, everything about it seems like... Especially when I mean, I wouldn't go as far as say like it's better than sex or something, but it's it's. <laughs> I think it might it might meet some of the things that your body wants. Yeah. That are similar, like you know what your body wants with sex. Like maybe some of those things are satisfied by dancing. Oh yeah. And it actually you know sates some of those things and and is healthy and yeah I I found yeah I mean it's. Dancing, excuse me, dancing. Awesome. I know me too. I've been like I didn't say excuse me though because. You were talking, and I was like, darn it, we have a mic, it probably heard it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, would I edit out burps in this? Like, probably, but honestly, these I mics mean, kind of suck, so. If you're going to do curse words, you have to include the burps. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of cultures, it's a compliment, right, to, oh, to burp during. That's, that's why I've, I've always heard that. I don't know if it's true, but it makes sense. Can we go to those places? <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get Americans to be less uptight because I feel like so many cultures have it right they're yeah. like there's no re- like let's say you're not at work mm-hmm. right why worry why worry about what people are going to think about you if you're not at work this is so true yeah you know what's so funny with the pandemic okay I lost my job and everything and I've always been a woman to have like two or three jobs whatever the pandemic happened so I went on unemployment and I never mm-hmm. like my like, I, I feel like I couldn't even tell my dad that because he's super conservative mm. and, you know, I could talk to my mom about it. She falls on a different end of the political spectrum, but... You felt like it was going to be a I point felt of like judgment. I couldn't tell anyone. Yeah. Meanwhile, like, so much of the world is like, not the world, the United States. Well, no, but even the developed countries in Europe, too, they've had these, like, social um, sort of safety cushions going yeah, that's happened all, all over the all pandemic. Around, yeah. But you're right, like, for people who are kind of out of work for a little bit, like, it's hard to talk about because you feel like... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. And and it's and there's so many topics that are like that. Mm-hmm. One's money, for example. Even professionally, people are afraid to talk about money, but there's some cultures where... They're like, that's... hey, no tengo dinero. Yeah, hey. yeah, like, they might be very open about... How much money they're making, and first, if you do that with coworkers, that actually lets people know if they're getting paid what they think they're worth. I, I so agree. I listen. You to have to be people. careful with that, though, I, because it's not accepted in American culture. I don't mm-hmm. think necessarily you could just immediately start going around and saying, "Here's what I make," and it would be accepted. And people, because yeah. If you make more than them, they might resent you, or your, you know, there are dangers of it. But I do think it's it's 
healthy to be comfortable talking about these difficult subjects. Obviously. Yeah, for me though, I think it's better to err more on the side of transparency than yeah. like trying to cover things up. Yeah. And then also, I think that like talking about how much you make, like there are differences too between men and women and what they make. You mm. know, there's all kinds of things happening right now politically, at least that we're trying to get happening that change that. But I think a lot of the reason why some women don't make the same as men, for example, is because of the lack of transparency and maybe them not realizing the differences. Like somebody might be more willing to say the exact number they make on a survey than they do with their colleague in the cubicle yeah. next door. You know, I think a lot of it comes up to norms too. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think guys are used to being more aggressive and that's... Yeah, ask for a raise. So, yeah, and I mean, what psychologists, I mean, not to go down this rabbit hole, but yeah. psychologists will talk about like, a lot of times, like women will be more agreeable, so they 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 might do things that are like, oh, this will make this person, you know, be happier, or this will help this person, mm -hmm. and that's what, and they're more likely to do those sorts of things. Whereas professionally, like men are more likely to go like, no, this is what I demand, and for that yeah. reason, they might, you know, get paid more. Um, yeah. But yeah, for me, it's like just how good is the person's work? Like I work in the creative field. Yeah. If someone's an amazing designer or artist or whatever they're like, maybe CGI artist or graphic designer, that's all that matters. I don't care what's in their pants. Like, yeah. what are they good at their craft? Yeah. You know? So for me, and I actually, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what matters to me. Um, and that's what matters to me about like anything, like what's good. Like I, I chase like quality and beauty yeah. and amazing, like whatever is exceptional and amazing. And I want to try so many different things and meet so many different people because I want to meet the exceptional people. And, yeah. and I know it sounds, I'm not comparing people to food, but you know, like maybe I, I won't have the best baklava until I try that weird corner store yeah. that sells baklava. I'm like, Hmm, maybe I should try it even though I might, you know, get sick to my stomach, like, I need to try that. I just feel a compulsion to oh, like, yeah. try all the different stuff, meet all the different people, and just explore and find the gems. What is your, do you ever cook? What's your favorite food to cook? Okay, but. I make breakfasty things, or like today, okay, so I go to Trader Joe's and I kind of go with whatever inspires me at the market. I like to I be Trader more veggie based. I noticed actually. I was like, <laughs> when I saw Trader the Joe's pizza products. you were about to make, I was like, mm. yeah. Like, oh, and for anyone watching, the tart Aubrey, I think it's called, mm -hmm. from Trader Joe's, it's like they import it from France. It's kind of like phyllo dough in a bunch of layers, and then it has brie and tomatoes and another cheese. And it's like, a, as far as frozen pizzas go, it's a four bucks. And it's way better than any American frozen pizza. Wow. It's so good. It's crispy. It's crunchy. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. <laughs> so back to you. Back to me. So yeah, today like I was going to make a zucchini noodle with some kind of like mm. a pumpkin curry thing. I just make shit up. Like I don't have, I, I don't, and, and if I'm cooking for someone, then I'll go with like basics like how about bacon and eggs? You know, but if it's for me, then I'll be like, and here's some spinach greens and tomato and onion and da da da. Mm -hmm. And if I've tried it a few times, then maybe, but like it, it really depends on my audience. Man, I used to do, I'm a breakfast fan. I used to do these burritos mm -hmm. when I lived in Alaska. I would do, like, let's see, I was waking up early, going to Anchorage from Eagle River, so like 30, 40 minute drive, and I'd wake up, you know, a little bit earlier for that, and I'd do a burrito, I'd toast a tortilla. Mm -hmm. Well, first I'd, I'd saute, I'd, I'd take bratwurst and just squeeze it out of the tube, mm -hmm. and, and chop it up like breakfast sausage, mm -hmm. like ground sausage, and I would use beer broths, mm -hmm. and I would brown that, and then I'd put in my eggs. Mm -hmm. mix that together and then put cheese on top and then I brown my my tortilla flour mm -hmm. tortilla put that stuff in roll it up because I learned at a restaurant like how to roll it so that it's a solid burrito mm -hmm. and then finish it so it's folded up and it gets like crispy and hardened so it's like a solid burrito yeah it won't fall apart and then just eat that on the drive to work and it was crispy like the tortilla There's was crunch something about eating while driving too that's Ooh, so yeah. satisfying <laughs> but yeah. yeah like 
Speaking of making burritos, I'm such a bad cook that actually my first job was at Taco Bell. And my initial position was in like the taco making station. I was so bad at rolling burritos that they put me on the, no, it wasn't that bad. Like it was still kind of like decent stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I was so bad at rolling burritos and I was constantly like cracking the crunchy tacos that they put me on the register. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, which i preferred anyways because i was much more of a people person i was like yeah this is probably better for everyone (laughs) yeah i worked at chick-fil-a as my first full-time job Mm -hmm. started when i was 14 Mm -hmm. well that wasn't full-time they only let you work a certain amount of age but i mean i wasn't in the kitchen usually but that was that was interesting it's funny how how uh, excited i got about breaking records in the drive-thru yeah like we some lunches we did one lunch i was the cashier at the drive through and i did 160 cars in one hour which is over what is that that's almost three cars per minute through the drive through wow it was either 160 or 180 i think it was 160. yeah and they give you like 20 bucks bonus like they're like which you broke a, a record deal you get at that time like when you're a teenager in yeah, high school it like, is Twenty dollars. It's like wow. the ga- my gas money for this week. Like, That's true. Yeah, and and I was like, yeah, I was dead broke, and so that twenty buck bonus was like, holy shit! Mm-hmm. Like this is I, I'm gonna do this again. Oh, I can get taco sticks. That was my best yeah. Friend. Right. <laughs> Whereas in New York now, I'm like, that's a joke. Like, that's a that's an Uber. Or yeah. Something. That's a. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Money falls out of your pockets here. Yeah. Absolutely. Even you know, like bodegas, like oh, I'm gonna get. Like a, a sparkling water from bodega, and then it's like sometimes it's like six bucks or something because they just and that's the thing about New York is you have fewer grocery stores, more tiny little you mm-hmm. know they call them bodegas like basic corner stores that have overpriced but a lower inventory yeah and lower traffic but yeah it's overpriced and so if you subsist off of of uh, bodega food mm-hmm. you're actually paying probably higher than Whole Foods, honestly. Mm, that's it's, a good point. And I was doing that a lot in East Village, actually. But Trader Joe's is awesome. I actually want to do a series where I review. This might be fun, actually. I review just products from Trader Joe's, and I might start with my favorite, but just say they just started stocking this new, you know, frozen pizza or fresh bread or you know, this vegetables in season. Let's I'm see down it. to yeah. be here for that. Like, if you, <laughs> if you need a second opinion. I'll okay. Say. Cheers. Cheers. I'll set the time. So a question for you, Annie. Yes. I'm What's listening. an experience you've had, whether it's food related, dance related, or just, you know, a social situation where it was like extremely, maybe it was a new experience or it was just really interesting or enjoyable or, it was just like really eye opening, or just a generally pleasurable experience, like just a great based on trying something new, or base just something that was like really interesting and exciting, like just an experience. Okay, in dance, or it could in be general. dance, it could be food related, it could be just social related, okay. just some sort of experience. Yeah. Um. Okay, I'll talk about dance just because that's like my world. Yeah. Although food is my world too, but it's my <laughs> my new world. Um, so my experience in learning to lead mm. has been incredible because I've been a, fo- a follower of other dance styles for years and years, but for the central bachata, just two years I have as a follower. And, um, so leading, I just started actually this summer, but I came into it with already experience as a dancer mm. and I already knew a lot of the other leaders, you know, mostly the guys, you would say, are the leaders. And one of my favorite things about becoming a a leader are the guys who ask me to lead them. Like, I led you a little bit, and you were like, okay, I'll try it. I was really bad follow but yeah. Yeah, but it's been really interesting because I feel like there I have a few guys in mind um, who are really great leaders and they asked me to lead them and I thought about it and I'm like, you know, they could have asked anyone to lead them this whole time, but they didn't want to be led because usually leaders are men and all of a sudden there's, there's a female a leader around it. 
Exactly. Yeah. Now that there's a female leader on the dance floor, now the guys aren't afraid to follow. Yeah. If it's by me. And it's yeah. been really interesting for me to kind of think about and have these little aha moments on the dance floor and also grow with these guys because, you know, some of them I would lead them and then afterward they'd be like, okay, so that, that dance was okay. But because they know how to lead, they're like, but actually your hand grip can go this way and that way. Because mm. as a follower, I didn't know what they were supposed to do when they were trying uh, to lead a yeah. thing. But they were able to to experience the move as a follow when they're used to being the leader and for their perspective. So getting their support, getting their feedback, yeah. and also getting, uh, just recognizing that they kind of like following, mm. but there are some barriers that, that still need to be broken. Yeah. Are well, I found with good bleeding in dancing, whether it's East Coast Swing, Bachata, whatever, if you're a good leader or, well, what I, the longer I've danced those dances, I really enjoy being able to sense what the follow is doing. Like maybe the follow wants to do a spin and I'm like, yeah, let's do a spin and then let's mm -hmm. do this and just go with the punches and, and just be fluid and, and su right. susceptible to their suggestions and, and just making it really fluid. Yeah. And so really a good leader, if you think about it, is a follow too. A really good leader yeah. can follow. Because yeah. if you're dancing with someone like and I'm leading and you're following and you're like, I want to do a spin and you start spinning out and I'm just like, I didn't initiate that. What are you doing? I'm being a bad leader, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost you like can roll with it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's also it's it's not just about the experience and growing as a leader and getting this that's exactly right, because you have to like, you know, you kind of come together like it's both of your idea when you want to hit something in the music, you know? Like, yeah. like here comes the refrain. Oh, no, what are we going to do? But also in seeing, like, because I, I also have, I don't want to call it an agenda, but I a have mission, maybe. A, a, a little mission to see um, more openness, especially in the Latin dance world. When it comes to who's leading and who's following, mm. I don't want it to be so gendered. Gotcha. Yeah. Decisive. You know, I want it to be so. In seeing like, in seeing these guys actually ask me if they could follow when I go, "Hey, want to dance with Billy? Yeah, can you lead me though?" Like. Hmm, you know you could get this if you ask that guy too. Like you don't need me for that. That's another reason why I love dance though, is I can get I can like have needs met and it's not dependent on having one person in my life. And that was something like a transition for me coming from my pre dance life to my life mm -hmm. as a dancer. Because these needs, like the huggy needs and the affection needs and yeah. like the that you know, yes, dance has a sense of community, but there's also these needs that you just like, mm, yeah. I feel like I've been a much stronger woman as a mm. dancer because I'm not as dependent on some, like just whatever person will happen to be around to give me the affection that I need. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It gives you the confidence to just be yourself and not be like, I need that validation or something because yeah. you have the the family of the dance community family, to yeah. yeah no yeah totally and I think that's part of why some people emphasize family so much mm -hmm. um, like they spend a lot of time with their family and I think it's good to spend time with a lot of your, with your literal family mm -hmm. I think part of the reason why that has traditionally been so emphasized mm -hmm. is I think it provides that actually yeah. when you, when you're interacting with people that where there's no agenda to like get laid or to be in a relationship mm -hmm. or, and it's just connection with other humans, it can help you be more confident. It can help you be more trusting and more open to experience and more and have those like huggy needs yeah. fulfilled. And uh, yeah, I, so dance is like almost an extension of, of what I think a family provides. Yeah, and it's hard to ask for that, especially like in a city like New York with so many people. I feel like it can still be one of the loneliest cities, you know? And like, you can't like yeah. download Tinder. Like on like, the street, for example, people are very closed on the street in New York. Yeah. Like if you just say, hey, good morning, forget about They're it. They're like, 
what do you want? <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, this guy's about to ask me for or, something. Or they must be from the Midwest. Like, they don't know if yeah. they're from New York yet. <laughs> yeah. But then if you're dressed like a New Yorker and you're saying, hey, good morning, they're like, this guy's trying to trick me. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Um, it's, it's a strange place. But then once you're at an event, then it's like, okay, now these are my people. It's a safe space, yeah. though. It's a safe space. Yeah. Yeah. Because I realized that, that on a street, on a sidewalk, New Yorkers are cold. Mm -hmm. And I am. Like, when I drive down the street and I'm at a stoplight and someone's like waving through my windshield, I'm like, leave me alone. Like, I'm trying to get somewhere. Yeah. Or if I'm walking down the sidewalk and someone's like, hey, mister, I'm like, leave me alone. But if once I get to my destination and I'm with people, then I'm just like, okay, I'm in my place. I'm going to talk. Yeah. It's just a, it's a defense mechanism that, yeah. that I think just happens because of how the hustle in New York, how aggressive people are in New York, people just end up having, out of necessity, having to sort of have laser vision and just get to their destination because in between is where you get, you know, accosted or tricked or... Yeah, it's yeah. true, but it's not always safe. Like, that makes me think of, like, I had this moment where I recognized I was becoming more of a New Yorker and less of a Midwesterner because I was sitting on the train... And usually when I'm on the train, I have my headphones, which usually keeps you safe. It keeps you out of unwanted conversations, hands down, because you've got <laughs> headphones in. Yeah. I did not have headphones in in this one moment. And this guy just started talking to me, like, like first, you know, some compliment, like, hey, I like the jacket. And I'm like, oh, thank you. And automatically, like, from a New York perspective, that was a mistake, because then I'm like, yeah. so where are you from? And, and then right away, I realized what I'd done. And also, too, this was, like, at some point in the night, so I didn't want to, like, I was like, oh, shit, I took it too far just by saying thank you. So I was like, I'm so sorry, I really need to get some emails done. So then I started writing some fake emails. I, like, opened up an email, and I was, like, <laughs> writing an eviction notice from to my boyfriend. <laughs> like, I was like, what's a real-looking email thing that can get me out of this conversation? <laughs> Did it work? Yeah, the guy stopped talking to me, and then I, like, you know, I just kind of kept typing until, like, I got off the train. And then it was funny, yeah. like, I took a screenshot of it and was like, babe, you almost got evicted tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. There have been a few cases where in the subway I've met, I've talked to people, and it was a genuine conversation, but it was usually I initiated it. Yeah. Like, uh, I was looking for diamond-stitched loafers. But I couldn't find a good brand, and this girl had, uh, I forgot what brand it was, but these, like, loafers for women that were, like, a tennis shoe style. And I was like, that actually looks like it could be a men's shoe. Like, mm -hmm. in that shoe that she's wearing, I dig it. And I asked her, she's like, it's this brand. Later, I looked it up, and they don't have men's sizes, mm -hmm. but it's, we had a conversation about that brand. And it was just a brief conversation, and, and it was great. Another time, there was some lady, and we talked about, like, theater, and she was, like, a theater kid, and she loved the theater and everything, oh, yeah. and that was fun, and she was super enthusiastic about it. But 98% of the time, it's it's like yeah. someone tried to get something from you, unfortunately. And I think it depends on the time of day, too. Yeah. And like, you know, if I see some cute kid with, like, a sparkly tutu on, then I'll definitely be like, hey, you look so cute, you know, but... Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I think it's important in New York especially to have, you know... To actually have friends and it sounds kind of sad to say that but a lot of new yorkers mm -hmm. push people away because they're afraid because first of all you might meet someone in new york and then they move that happens all the time mm -hmm. or you meet someone somewhere else and then they move to new york <laughs> you know like yeah and because of that i think a lot of people are very careful with who they're like almost let into their inner circle like who mm -hmm. they because they're afraid that people will disappear and so i think a lot of new yorkers don't build close connections a lot of them they're playing a socialite game and they're trying to just amass yeah. acquaintances without really building yeah. you'll find that with like i've worked with people for a long time and then they're like it, they're at the point where they could trust me with their deepest darkest secrets and i wouldn't you know mm -hmm. but they're still often playing the game of like oh i'm gonna say what what i should say so that yeah. i don't look bad it's like New Yorkers are afraid to put their guard down a lot of times. Yeah, I went home to Montana, and it's so amazing how much more time you have with people outside New York. New York, like, there's, I, I don't know what happens. So, it, like, the city itself wears you down and exhausts you, and you don't really have time to, like, open up and be vulnerable. And it's just, like, the, the complexity, too, like, 
you know, even just trying to get together for this podcast, it's like yeah. we have to account for the the. We had to find the one the slot of time where both of us could. Yeah. Do it. yeah. We would like live in different boroughs, which is like a commute. You know, like it's not so. Yeah, people. Some people think it's New York City, and it is pretty concentrated. But actually, the boroughs are. No, it's like an hour. I I drove home for an hour this morning. Like. <laughs> Yeah. What? And then have to find parking. And I drive every day from one part of Brooklyn to another part of Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and it takes me like 35 minutes. So, That's nuts. Yeah, yeah, versus in Montana, I can get anywhere within 15 minutes. And if you have to go 15 minutes for somewhere, you're like, oh my gosh, it's so far. It's another city <laughs> at that point. It's another place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I think it's actually important. And I want to almost start a movement of New Yorkers who are more vulnerable putting themselves in the place like hey you know i want to make new york friends i want to i want to make friends with that person who's in town just for the weekend but might visit again like yeah. i want to open myself up to that but see dance yeah. does that though. yeah it does it does and what i think though if you are going to go through with it can you like make something that's like with your neighbors though because i feel like i can make friends but i make friends with people who live somewhere where <laughs> I just want yeah. to have friends. When do we talk to our neighbors? That I can walk to, yeah. or some like. Do you ever talk to your neighbors? No, I don't know. I don't even yeah. know the people living downstairs in my building. Now I did help a neighbor get into her apartment when she had locked herself out. Well, yeah. I never, I didn't succeed because our locks are really good here, actually. Yeah. But uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, sorry. They have modern locks here. <laughs> um, but I was trying to use a credit, an old credit card, to swipe the lock for like forty-five minutes, and we were drinking beer in the hallway. Yeah. But haven't talked to her since. I know, and I would just That's, like. Yeah. As soon as people leave their door, they're going to their next destination. Yeah. So it's really what I want to do is I might make something like baklava. I haven't made that in years, but I make oh. some bomb baklava. I'll do. I do like a lemon yogurt sauce. Yeah. So it's like super sweet, saturated with the syrup and crispy, and then like a yogurt sauce with no sugar yeah, added. Yeah, kind of so cuts it. Cuts it. Yeah. I should make that and just like knock my neighbor's door and be like, have some block with them. Yeah. I but now with like the COVID thing, it's like people would be like. I made it wearing gloves. I was, yeah. I was wearing gloves the And the time. mask, gloves and the mask. Was, yeah. By the way, we're clean. Yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> we um, know. We yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, we know what's happening in the world. Yeah, we do. We're, we're down with, with the current situation. Yeah. We're not down with it, but, you know. You know we what respect it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's been something that's interesting in my classes too. Is like, you know, in these movement classes, things are kind of slowly opening up where you can go in. The dance classes are in person with which I'm teaching NYC follows on Instagram. Yeah, somehow you can't watch movies. So. <laughs> what? I think movie theaters are still. Closed. Yeah, you still can't watch movies, Strange. but you can go to a dance class. But we wear our masks and everything, and that's been like a really. You know, that's quite the experience. Like, it's interesting, though. I feel like we're missing people's facial expressions and stuff. But still, like, much rather dance than not. Yeah. And I was going to get, like, this year, I was going to get more into dance mm -hmm. and more into going to, to museums and stuff. I was like, this is my year. I'm going to experience yeah. New York. And then... Yeah. Pandemic. Well, you should go. We're going to start doing partner classes, too, cool. soon. So right now, we're, we're, we're getting a really nice group of ladies together. And uh, then I think good. in maybe a month or so, we're going to have some partner classes at the museum. Okay, cool. Join us. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I need to dance more because I always... Now, I will say, um, I think Latin dance is my style of, because I, I keep going to like East Coast dance, East Coast swing things. And I think just the crowd for me, like mm -hmm. bachata and stuff, better fit. Because I'm just so chill and so like I'm just looking to have a good time, enjoy the music, mm -hmm. and that's what Latin dance is. East Coast swing, you know, it's just a little bit more buttoned up, and it's just yeah. a little bit different than my vibe. Yeah, I still like it, and I like being able to do it when the time rises. But yeah, I, I think I'm a Latin dance guy. I think I've embraced that I like bachata, and I'm open to the other ones. But I'm the best at bachata. It's the most in sync with the way I am. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I recommend bachata because it's pretty simple to learn. 
if you're looking to, like, if you've never danced before, like, let's say someone's trying to get over their fear of rejection, which I don't care what anyone says, we all have that fear. Yeah. Because that's what prevents people from talking to a stranger that they that they actually trust. Like, if you trust someone and you're not talking to them, it's because you're afraid of re rejection. I mean, that's what it is. You're afraid if you open up a conversation about your favorite hobbies that they're going to be like, oh, that's cool, and you're going to feel upset because like, they... Oh, cool you, story, bro. Exactly. <laughs> so, or it's like you like this girl and you're nervous, and yeah. it's all of it. Or even like you want to tell your dad about something that happened in your childhood, but you're afraid that he's going to judge you for it. It's family stuff. It's friend stuff. It's dating stuff. And I think dancing, especially folk dances too, because folk dances are a nice gateway drug because yeah. they're very like, you're going to be dancing with little old ladies and just, it's very yeah. wholesome atmosphere. And it's very, there's not any sensuality really. It's just yeah. very like proper and, and, and just fun and yeah. kind of bouncy. So contra dancing, line dancing, square dancing, sw country swing. Yeah. Uh, country swing crowds are really fun. They're just like looking to hilarious. They just want yeah. to rip your arms out of your shoulder. Yeah, they just they want to throw it. you across the room <laughs> while they're chugging a beer. You know, it's great. All in good fun. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. They're it's a very but it's also a very wholesome crowd. Yeah. Like uh, and so getting into that, I think really helps get over that fear of rejection mm -hmm. and that's a huge part like i don't care what anyone says all of us deal with that um i mean what it, it could be professional family uh all that stuff um and dancing helps with it and that's the for me that's the main benefit that mm -hmm. i found from dancing and yeah i feel like i like your comparison with east coast swing versus like the latin dancing like bachata i feel like it also translates it's a cultural thing too like the latin world just feels much more warm welcoming and inviting like i was just talking i realized too i'm actually part costa rican so I that's probably why? just a 16 or something oh, okay, okay. but i'm wondering if there's a little bit of it that was like yeah you like latin dance yeah, just snuck like, yeah. Love you. yeah. <laughs> sorry i interrupted but you were saying that's cool yeah. i'm a 16th native american and i love <laughs> no i'm not anyways um <laughs> <laughs> but um like i feel like in the dance world, the, the there's similarities between Latin dance and non-Latin dances, just as there are in the cultures. Like, I was talking about birthdays with my Portuguese teacher today. She's from Brazil, so Latin America. And um, I was telling her the difference between when I celebrate birthdays, like my mom's birthday versus my boyfriend's mom's birthday. Like, it was my mom and I don't really give each other presents or anything. Like we might the day of go grab something. Like she gave me sunglasses for my birthday, which, you know, but because she heard me on the phone on the way there being like, okay, mom, I'm just going to go by the store and get some sunglasses and then I'll be there. Versus like, you know, my boyfriend's family's Dominican. They like make dinner. The family gets together. They get cards. Like my mom doesn't really want a card or anything like that. And my Portuguese teacher thought it was so like, like, I was like, mm, that's just, you know, there's there's not as much, like, warmth in, in our culture, in the East Coast swing culture, as there is in the Latin culture, where it's like, come, right. eat, Dance was historically almost like a formal thing. Like, yeah. when I grew up doing ballroom dance, it was, this is for formal events. Mm -hmm. It was never like, this is what you do when everyone's hanging out. And, and it's a very different, it's like our, it's like the approach to dance is just different. And for that reason, it's like East Coast Swing ends up being too formalized for some reason. Yeah. And also, like, some dances feel more formal versus others feeling more affectionate. Like, the Latin yeah. dances include so much more affection. Right. Well, the thing is, too, you could dance bachata with your daughter, with your cousin, mm -hmm. with your sister. Oh, yeah. with your. It's not, like... It's not It's sexual. not a sexual thing. Yeah. Right. It's just, like, in Italy, or I don't know where, they'll, like, kiss, like, a father will kiss his son on the mouth. Yeah. Because they're just comfortable being very physically affectionate in a non-sexual way yeah. with their family. And it's like bachata is close, but it's like a hug is close. Yeah. It's not like someone hugs their mom and they're like, oh, that was a little bit too close for me. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's just, it, it's compatible with across the spectrum. Like, sure, if you're, you know, trying to flirt with someone, like bachata is a good move. Mm-hmm. 
but you can also dance it with your family. Like it, it's yeah. very adaptable. It's not just for one purpose. It's, right. it's cousins. It comes down to human connection, right? And like parent that's and child will dance it with each other. Yeah, human yeah. connection, pure and simple. And music is a great catalyst for that. And just having the standard, you know, basic moves and then building on that, it's it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to get Americans especially to dance more. Come dance with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if they want to do, uh, what's it called again? Bachata Fusion NYC. So they. So what's the Instagram? Bachata Fusion NYC. <laughs> gotcha. So is that how they should where they should go to yeah. learn more? Okay. Go to Bachata Fusion NYC, and I love conversations. I love it when I get messages from people. I love talking to people about it. You know, just finding what works for you. You know, our we offer group classes every other week, but for people who want a little bit more or some like more in depth study with it, or just to be really more a part of the fam, because I love hanging out with everybody. Honestly, mm -hmm. I love each one of the. Right now, we just have a girls group. Soon, we're doing the partners. I love each and every one of them. It's like a family. So we do offer private lessons in between. These group classes. So cool. message me. <laughs> yeah. And again, that's uh, Bachata Fusion NYC mm -hmm. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. right? Bachata Fusion NYC. Do um, so they have to pronounce it that way or can they butcher it? Uh, I mean, how can you explain <laughs> it? Yeah. Bachata Fusion NYC. <laughs> N -A -A -N -A -E -C, right? It's how you would say N -A -E -C. Bachata Fusion NYC. <laughs> Man, things are way sexier when we say them in Spanish, right? I see. Yeah. See, mi amor. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, like, why, it, like, ever, if someone speaks, like, French or pretty much anything other than English, it, they right. sound like, oh, that person's cool, or yeah. that person's hot, but then, but, I don't know, like, even... American English, especially, I'm like... Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I guess people, like, Americans, especially, like, British English. I do like British English, yeah. 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 But then... To me, the more British people I've met, the less I'm like, oh, man, that's a cool accent. It, it loses I'm, its, like, sense of being exotic, yeah. you know? Something yeah. about the other that's so exciting. Right. I really love, like, I like Middle Eastern accents, too. Mm -hmm. They're really cool. Mm -hmm. Like, kind of chic sounding. And then I also like um, Jamaican accents are dope. Huh. And then cool. uh, I'm trying to think what else accents I like. Australian, New Zealand, those accents, okay. they confuse me because I feel like I can imitate a lot of accents, but those ones, like, never. Anytime I've tried to do an Australian accent, I just sound British. I feel like, yeah, when it comes to accents, I can do, like, uh, Minnesota, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't you know? <laughs> but aside from that, like, it's yeah. just, it's a mutt, my, my, like, yeah. mimicking. Yeah. What's uh what's one food weird rabbit trail, but what's one food from somewhere you traveled to that just wasn't surprising, that blew your mind or that was just a really good find? Ooh, see I've traveled a lot. Like I'm I'm a huge right, traveler. Okay, cool. Um so how did you So like what's the country and city or whatever and then I know. Oh, I think. Or uh -huh. Something that you thought was going to be amazing, but it was actually bad. Okay, that one's easy. Okay. Okay, when I was in Iceland, um, I happened to be in Reykjavik, that's the mm -hmm. capital, um, for this, like, annual food festival thing. So all the regular restaurants were only offering, like, five or seven course tasting menus. So I was like, okay, all right, I'm down for this. It wasn't on purpose that, that like, the person I went with at this time... And I were there, but it was like, cool, okay, we're going to go try some tasting menu. So on the tasting menu was whale mm. and puffin. Yeah, okay. I don't recommend either one of was those Was it things. cured or something? I think the puffin was smoked. It was just so, like... Like, like tripe or something? Bitter. Or was it just... Oh, bitter, okay. And... I don't know how to explain it. I mean, it's a, it was smoked, like, bird. Like, I, I don't know how, it was like. Oh, right. Puffin's like the tiny penguin. Yeah. Or they like, almost like a. Okay. Uh, 
I don't know. And then the whale... Um, was this like a native Icelandic food or something? They were they were trying to make a play on like what they would eat. Yeah. Okay. And the whale, though, was just... What was that? Was that the skin or was it the meat or what? It, Both? Or? I think... Because it was red, so I don't think it could have been the blubber, right? Because the blubber you so think is meat. white. Okay. It was some kind of meat, and it was really kind of like irony kind of flavor. Right, okay. Well, they're so big that and so old that they're probably absorbing the metals of the ocean for many, yeah. many years. Yeah. And that'll happen with older fish. Um, I never thought of yeah. it that way. And that's why seafood smells seems metallic, is my understanding, is that it's actually absorbing all the metals in the oh, floating around the ocean. Yeah, that um, makes sense. So if you're not supposed to eat seafood like every day, I've heard, because mm -hmm. I don't, okay. I'm not a scientist. I'll have to defer to Dr. Pumpkin. Uh -huh. But um, I think that seafood has like high levels of certain metals that, you know, like yeah. a little bit of mercury, a little bit. Um, I had a whale in Alaska. There's this thing called muktuk. Mm -hmm. I think it's called that, mm -hmm. which is like the skin. It's like, it looks like a rainbow kind of. It's like the skin and the blubber mm -hmm. and maybe a little, I think it's skin and blubber. And it looks kind of like ba like black and white bacon almost. And they cure it or something and it's really chewy. And that just didn't taste that much to me. Oh. It was just kind of like, okay, you know, it didn't have that much flavor. It wasn't disgusting or anything, but it just didn't have much flavor. Yeah. Um, but, oh man, smoked salmon. Which I had a lot I of in Alaska. Salmon. That's I good. I love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah. What's this thing that you have over there? Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so so this is my Shun Fuji chef knife and then a honing rod. So I was going to have you basically what a honing rod does is it realigns the blade mm -hmm. so that it's a little bit sharper, it's a little bit straighter when you're chopping. Okay. It doesn't technically sharpen it, but as you use a knife, it sort of curves off to the side. Oh. And you can look up videos on YouTube of Alton Brown and various other people explaining this process, where basically it'll get these little burrs that go off mm -hmm. to the sides, and so it almost rounds the blade. Mm -hmm. This is pretty sharp, so be careful, but basically before um, you prepare a meal, you could use the honing rod. And basically, you're running it along and sort of straightening out okay. those curvatures, if okay. that makes sense. So that's about the angle you want, okay. like that. So what I'll do is just hold it, hold this in, like, are you left or right? I'm right-handed. Right okay, yeah, put that in your left hand. My left hand. Yeah, and then hold that like that. And basically, you want to, um, yeah, something like that. And then you turn it over and do the other side. And now another thing you could do is turn it like this, start uh -huh. down at the bottom. Uh-huh. And actually, are your hands in your frame? There you go. Okay. <laughs> start down at the bottom and go up like that. Yeah. And then... But it's the blade I want to move or this thing that I want to move? Yeah. So you actually might want to move that. That's why I'm doing it. So yeah, then you go to... Chance. Okay. So, yeah. So go across with that. And then you don't actually have to turn it over because there's two sides to this, right? So you can go across and out with that and then go on the bottom, right? So then put the edge, then put this edge up a little bit and start over here again. Well, <laughs> put the blade like over here and then pull, pull the blade across it again. Yeah, and then put the blade on top and start over here. No, don't turn over the blade, just, yeah. Oh! Yeah, so then you just put it below, put the knife below, do it, and then put the knife above. Yeah, there you go, okay. <laughs> so at that point, you're you're straightening out those burrs, perfect, uh -huh. yeah. 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 Cool, I've never done that before. So, I mean, the knife needs to be sharp for that to make sense because you have a dual knife. Uh -huh. It's just going to be dull and this isn't going to sharpen it. And so you either use a sharpening stone or you can take your knife to um, a, what do you call them, like a knife shop. Or you can send them off to the manufacturer sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or you can get the electric sharpeners, um, which take off a lot of steel. So you might want to be careful with that. with that. But once it's sharp, this is a great way to kind of keep it sharp. So if you're 
chopping veggies or meat or bread or doing a charcuterie board and you need your you know now that doesn't work with serrated blades that's the only thing this like uh, the ones that are like this yeah like yeah the, the ones that are ones? like that bread yeah knife? like a bread knife okay. this doesn't work um but uh yeah so okay yeah, cool nice thank Sweet. you <laughs> well uh yeah so thanks annie so much this thank has been you fun so much, Danny. thanks for teaching us about Dance. Danny. Yes. Danny and Danny. Yeah, I'm happy. Like it's my passion, so I could go for days, but yeah. <laughs> but message me if anybody has questions. Yeah. Drop into her DMs. That's right. Drop in my DMs. <laughs> you might regret that. <laughs> I feel like that someone is, is misleading. But um and if you have any um if you want any back, make yeah. sure to put that in the comments. Um if you're listening to the podcast, just hop into Instagram or YouTube, and you can interact there. The video is on Instagram and YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, just and then let also let me know what types of guests you'd like in the future. I think I sense that Annie's going to be back on at some point. Yeah, I have a certain friend yeah. who would be a really nice fit. For this right, podcast. your Somali so friend. Yeah, I hope, and he's pretty boisterous. Like it's okay. going to be a good time. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and you said you'd be behind the camera probably. Exactly, I will be the camera woman. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.